Let us pray. Eternal and everlasting God, three persons in one. We pray that our recollections and memories may be accurate, just, pleasing in your sight. May the whispers and thoughts of the inner chambers be pleasing before you. May we walk in humility, in deep fear of thy majesty, and yet love and reverence for you. Bless our memories and our retentiveness. Help us to serve you. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Well, we're back with um, well, let me just fix this for a moment if I can. There, that's a little better. We're with John Fox in volume four. 1499, we're talking about the Turks and they're pressing up into, towards Europe. Now, Henry was born in what, 1491, I believe. And 1485, Henry the Seventh becomes quite king of England. This is something that uh, is ongoing during Henry the Seventh and Eighth reign. The Turks on a roll at various successes. The next year, after this battle of Amarat was fought against the Christians at Varna, the Turk being now in and about the parts of Greece promised to bend all his force and main against the country of Epirus, belonging to Georgius, Castriotus, Scanderbius. Of this Scanderbius mention was made before how he brought was brought up in the Turks' court. From whence we, he, we declared how he servilely conveyed himself and came to the possession of his own patrimony in Epirus. The noble and victorious Scander Baeus, whom the Lord had raised up the second time, the same time with Huniatus to bridle, profited and vanquished seven of the most ex or dukes of the Ottoman Emperor, one after another, with all their armies of the most picked and chosen soldiers dislodged from their tents and utterly expelled them out of Epirus. When Amara himself with his whole puissance had environed about the city of Kral with cruel siege, that ordinance without measure, notwithstanding the said Sanderbaeus, through the power and blessing of the Lord, you don't find that in historical writings, beat him out of the field and repulsed him from the siege. After this discomfiture, the saying is that Amarath, to keep his vow made before at the victory of Varna, gave himself to a religious order, living in contemplative life with certain other priests joined unto him in the forest of Bithynia renouncing the government of his realm to the hands of Haley, one of the princes. Thou must understand that the Turk also be not without sundry sects of religion, no more than the Christians are without friars and the monks. Two Christian warriors in Europe stirred up of God to vanquish the Turks. In the meantime, while Amarat, this Turkish tyrant, was cloistered up in his monkish religion, Johannes Huniatus in the kingdom of Hungary, and Georges Castriotis in Greece kept a great stir against the Turks. By reason whereof, Amarat was taken again from his monkish vow and profession, and brought again into the field. For first, Huniatus had rescued the whole country of Hungary and had propulsed, moreover, all the might of the Turks far from Serbia. 
And although the peevish practice of George, Prince of Serbia, had oftentimes disclosed his counsels unto the Turks, whereby twice he was brought into danger, Yet notwithstanding, through the Lord's gracious protection, he was preserved and delivered by the said George unto the Hungarians again. And after that, manfully vanquished the Turks so that they had no resting place in their parts. Now we turn to Amarat and Muhammad II. On either side in Greece, Castriotis, Gondorbeus, so foiled the Turk defense of his country, Epirus and Macedonia, and kept Amarat so short that not only he was not able to win any great town in Epirus, but also coming from Epirus. <coughs> in the Straits, he so strangled Castriotis that he was forced to give, give battle, in which battle he was so vanquished and most part of his army slain that for grief and sorrow he, following into a raving madness, was transported out of his pavilion into Adrianople, and there in furious, fury and madness died after he had reigned 34 years, which was about 1450. Geniza, Geniza, among the Turks, this Amorat first ordained the order of the Janizaries, who were the men children of such Christians as he conquered and took captive, whom he forced to renounce the faith of Christ, wherein they were baptized, and brought them up in Mohammed's law, and exercised them in the same feats of war as he did his own people. And after they came to man's estate, he named them Janizaries, that is to say, soldiers of a strange country, and made them to guard his person. They wear on their head, instead of a helmet, a white attire made of the grossest sort of wool, and in so many folds about their head that it cannot be pierced with a sword. It hangeth down on the back with the tail, and before on the forehead, it is garnished with gold and silver. At the first institution, there were but 8,000 in their garrison, but now there be twice so many. This of all bondage and servitude that the Christians suffer under the Turks is most intolerable and greatly to be of all Christians lamented. For what godly minds behold more to their grief than to see their children pulled from the faith of Christ, when they were baptized, and by whose blood they should be eternally saved. We stop right there to think about, what is it, 40 billion Gen Z children infected by the public school system, where God is ripped from before their eyes. And to be instructed and nourished with the blasphemous doctrine of Muhammad, and to be professed enemies of Christ and his church, and to make war against heaven, and to perish everlastingly. The servitude of mind is far greater than death itself, which if our princes would well consider, it would cause them rather to agree and bend their whole force and pull power against this cruel enemy. Mohammed the Ninth Emperor after Ottoman, his tyranny murdering his brethren. Amarat left behind him three sons, Mohammed, born of the daughter Despota, Prince of Servia, being 20 years of age, the second son, Tersinus, the name Calipine. This Tersinus being an infant and but 18 months old, was strangled at the commandment of the Turk by his servant Moses, himself being there present and beholding the horrible murder. And when Moses, the executor of the murder, had desired him not to pollute his hands with the blood of his brother, he answered that it was the manner of all Ottoman Turks that all other brethren being destroyed 
None should be left alive but one to govern the empire. Wherefore Moses was commanded by the tyrant there presently and in his sight to kill the infant. <clears throat> this horrible fact the child understood as she cried out and almost mad for sorrow cursed the tyrant to his face but he to mitigate the rage of the mother at her request being desirous to be revenged upon the executor of her son's death delivered the said Moses bound into her hands she then in the presence of the tyrant thrust him to the heart with a knife and opening his side took out his liver and threw it to the dogs to be devoured the third son Halabasa, a traitor to his master horrible parasite of the abominable turk we've got another god's providence to those whom he listeth to be saved the third son called calipine was but six, six months old the aforesaid Amarat, his father, commended to the custody of Halibasa, one of his nobles who, to gratify and please the tyrant, betrayed the infant. Some affirm that instead of Calipine, another child was offered unto the tyrant, and that Calipine was conveyed to Constantinople after taking Constantinople was carried to Venice and then to Rome to Pope Calixtus, where he was baptized, and afterwards came into Germany to Frederick the Emperor, and there was honorably entertained and kept in Austria during his life, where note how the merciful providence of God, whom he lists to save, can fetch out of the devil's mouth. And note, moreover, the aforesaid Halle Bassa, the betrayer of the infant, how he escaped not unrevenged. For Muhammad, understanding him to be a man of great substance and riches, through forging of false crimes with great torments, put him to death to have his riches. For this tyrant was given to insatiable avarice. Thus this bloody Muhammad began his regiment with horrible murder after the example of other cursed tyrants, his predecessors. Although this Muhammad, withstanding that he came of a Christian mother, being the daughter of Despota, Prince of Serbia, and by her brought up and instructed from his high childhood in the precepts of the Christian religion and manners, yet he, soon forgetting all, gave himself to Muhammad's religion and yet so that he, being addicted to neither religion, became an atheist, believing in worshiping no god at all, but only the goddess of good fortune, deriding and mocking the minds and judgments of men who believe that God by his providence governeth and regardeth the state of human beings on earth. After this, Muhammad had heard of the victories and conquests of other successors and under, understanding how Bajazat lay eight years about Constantinople and could not win it. He dispraising Bajazat and disdaining that so long time should be spent about the siege thereof and yet no victory gotten. Bent all his study and device how to sub subdue the stain but having privy hatred against the city of Athens and having his hands lately imbrued with the blood of his brethren, this murderous Muhammad, first of all, taketh his viage to subvert and destroy the aforesaid city, being a famous school of all good learning and discipline against which city he did so furiously rage for the hatred of good letters but he thought he ought not to suffer the foundation thereof to stand <clears throat> because that city was a good nurse and fosterer of good arts and science. Wherefore he commanded the city to be raised and utterly subverted. This is Athens. 
times we talk about the history of the Turks. Whatsoever monuments or books could be found, he caused them to be cast into dirty sinks in the filthiest places of the city and put to the most vile uses that he could be devised for extirpating and abolishing of all good literature, as if he understood any to lament the case and ruin of that noble place. Now for the siege and taking of Constantinople. Thus the famous and ancient school of Athens being destroyed and overthrown, he returned his army and power into Thrace, where in all haste, be gathering his power together both by sea and land, with a mighty multitude compassed the city of Constantinople about, and began to lay his siege against it. A.D. 1453, and in the four and fiftieth day of the said siege, he was taken, sacked, and the Emperor Constantine slain. As touching the cruelty and fierceness of the Turks in getting of this city, and what slaughter there was of men, women, and children, what calamity and misery were there to be seen, or as much as sufficient relation a full description thereof has been made before. It shall be superfluous now to repeat the same. This only is not to be omitted, touching three principal causes of the overthrow of the city, whereof the first was the filthy avarice of those citizens, who hiding their treasures in the ground would not employ the same to the necessary defense of their city. For so I find it in story expressed that when the Turk, after taking the city, had not found much treasure as he looked for, suspecting with himself, as truth was, the treasures to be hidden under the ground, he commanded the earth be digged up and foundations of the houses to be searched, where he found treasures incredible. What, quoth he, how could it be that this place could ever lack? munition and fortification, which did flow and abound with such great riches as here are and plenty of things. The second cause was the absence of the navy of the Venetians, which, if they had been ready in time, might have been a safeguard against the invasion of the enemies. The third cause also may be gathered upon occasion incident in the stories either for the city of Constantinople 15 years before, did yield to the Bishop of Rome, as is before to be seen, or else because, as in some writers, it is evident, the images were there received and maintained in their churches and by the Turks at the same time destroyed. An image of the crucifix in Constantinople Offenses given to the infidels by images in the churches. Johannes Ramos, writing of the destruction of this city, amongst other matters, maketh relation of the image of the crucifix. Being in the high temple of Sophia, which image the Turk took, and writing this subscription upon the head of it, Hic es Christanorum Deus, this is the God of the Christians, gave it to his soldiers to be scorned. Commanding the said image with a trumpet to be carried through all his army, made every man to spit at it most contumeliously. Wherein thou hast, good reader, by the way to know what occasion of slander and offense we Christians give unto the barbarous infidels by our ungodly superstition in having images in our temples contrary to the express commandment of God in his word. First, as St. Paul writing to the Corinthians say, we know Christ now no more after the flesh. How much less then is Christ to be known of us in blind stocks and images set up in our temples serving for no other purpose but for the infidels to laugh at us 
and at our God to scorn and to provoke God's vengeance, which by like example I fear may also fall upon other cities where such images and idolatrous superstition are maintained, whereof God grant Vienna to take heed betimes, which hath been so long and yet is in pain in such great danger of the Turks and polluted with so many images and plain idolatry. In Suba, to make the story short, talking about the cruel murder by the Turks in Constantinople and its lamentable destruction. Such was the cruelty of these Turks in winning the city that when Muhammad had given license to the soldiers three days together to spoil, to kill, and do whatsoever they wanted, there was no corner in all Constantinople which did not either flow with Christian blood or else was not polluted with abominable abusing the maids, wives, and matrons with all, without all reverence of nature. Of the citizens, some they mur murdered, some they roasted upon spits, of some they flayed off their skin, hanging them up to consume with famine. Into the wounds of others they put salt the more terribly to torment them, insomuch that one of them contented with another who could devise most strange kinds of new torments and punishments, exercising such cruelty upon them that the place where the city was before seemed to be no city, but a slaughterhouse or shambles of Christian men's bodies. Among the dead bodies, the body also of Constantine the emperor was found, whose head being brought to Muhammad, he commanded it to be carried upon a spear through the whole city for a public, public spectacle and derision of the Turkish army. Because he would diminish the number of the captives, which seemed to him to be very great, he never rose from his table, but put every day some of the nobles to death, no less to fill his cruel mind with blood than his body be filled with wine, which he used to do so long as any of the nobles of that city were alive. Of the other sort also, as the stories do credibly report, there passed no day in which he did not orderly slay more than 300 persons. The residue he gave to his rascal soldiers to kill and to do with them what they would. It is to be noted that as Constantine, the son of Helena, was the first Constantinople, so Constantine, the son also of Helena, was the last emperor thereof. The city of Para yieldeth for fear. Not far from the said city of Constantinople, there was another little city called Para. And once called Galatia, situated by the seaside, which hearing of the miserable destruction of Constantinople and seeing the city flaming with fire, sent certain of their chief men with speed to Muhammad, declaring unto him that they neither had sent any help to the city of Constantinople, nor yet wrought any detriment to any of his army. Wherefore they desired and prayed him that as they would gladly yield unto him, so he would be favorable and spare them and not punish the guiltless with the guilty. Muhammad, although he was not ignorant that for fear rather than any goodwill, they submitted themselves and that they would rather resist him if they had been able. Yet he received for that time the submission of the messengers, but sending with them his ambassador into the city he commanded his army to follow with all and to enter in with him into the city, which although it was greatly suspected and misliked of the citizens, yet they durst not otherwise do but suffer them to enter. This being done, the ambassador gave a sign to the soldiers 
every man to do whatsoever he was bidden, of whom some ran to the walls, some to the temples and churches, some to the streets and houses, plucking all things down to the ground, sacking and ranging with no less fury and abominable filthiness than they had done at Constantinople, saving only that they abstained from murder. But the same day letters came from Mohammed to the ambassador that he would spare none, but destroy and murder all that were ever in the city. Which message, because it seemed to the ambassador to be too cruel, for as much as they had yielded themselves, he stayed his hand a little until night time. In the meantime, drunken Muhammad, coming something to himself, whom drunkenness had before overcome, sent his second letters to revoke the first. For again, it is to be noted the merciful providence of God toward his people in their deserved plagues by staying the hands and bridling the fury many times of their enemies when otherwise the case seemeth to be past all remedy. Muhammad thus being in himself not a little advanced and elevated by the winning of Constantinople, for he had now made the imperial seat of the Turkish dominion. The third year following, to adventure more mastery, set out to the siege of Belgrade, the city of Hungary lying near to the banks of the Danube, thinking to have like success there as he had in the winning of Constantinople. Albeit through the Lord's disposing, it fell out much otherwise. Within the city of Belgrade, the same time of the siege thereof was Johannes Huniatus, <clears throat> the valiant captain of whom in divers places mention hath been made before, who with a sufficient strength of picked soldiers, albeit in number nothing equal to the Turks' army, valiantly defended the city with great courage and no less success. In this siege, great diligence was bestowed, and many of the Turks slain, among whom also Muhammad himself, being stricken with a pellet under his left arm, was fain to be carried out of the field for half dead. And the rest so put to flight, that of the Turks the same time were destroyed to that number 40,000 besides the loss of all their ordnance, which the Turks in the haste of their flight were forced to leave behind them. Hieronymus Ziegleris, writing of the siege of this Belgrade, addeth moreover, that when Mohammed was at the siege thereof, seeing the town to be so small and weak of itself, that it could not be won with all his great multitude, he staring and faring like a madman, commanded all his brazen pieces to be laid to batter down the walls and towers of the town so that the Christians within the walls were vehemently distressed for the siege continued both night and day without intermission. Among the rest of the Christians who defended the town, Hieronymus Zieglerus maketh mention of a certain Bohemian much worthy of his condign commendation, who being upon the walls and seeing a Turk with a banner or ensign of the Turks to be gotten up, by the sight whereof the whole town was in danger to be conquered and taken, runneth unto the Turk and clasping him about the middle, speaking to John Capistranus standing below, asking him whether it were any danger of damnation to him in his voluntary mind, and did cast him with that dog, as he termed him, down headlong from the wall to be slain with him. What should become of his soul, and whether he might be saved or not? And here we'll bring this to an end, as this has been the history of the Turks, the conquest of Constantinople. Uh, 
of the despoliation, despoliation of Terra and the attempted conquest of Belgrade. And we'll resume this in our next session. Glory be to the Father, to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost. Amen.